Aloha, I'm Senator Russell Ruderman, State Senator from the Puna and Kau District on the Big Island, and you're here at the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you for joining us today. Today our guest is Paul Achitoff. Paul Achitoff graduated from Harvard College and the Columbia Law School, and for the last 22 years has been managing attorney for the Hawaii Office of Earth Justice, a national nonprofit public interest environmental law firm. Paul practiced business and environmental litigation in private practice in Los Angeles and Honolulu for 11 years before joining Earth Justice in 1994. He's handled a wide variety of public interest environmental matters, such as endangered species, commercial fisheries, water pollution, and stream restoration cases. For the past decade, Paul has focused on addressing problems caused by genetically modified organisms and pesticides. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show, Russell. So lately you've been very involved in uh, defending three of the counties in uh, GMO or pesticide-related cases that, tell me about that, there's three counties passed bills, each of which was overturned in a court and is now under appeal. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Now, I'm, I'm not representing uh, Maui County or the County of Kauai, I'm representing community groups on Kauai that is defending the Kauai ordinance. I see. And I am representing the County of, of uh, Hawaii, Hawaii. Uh, but I'm not involved in the, the Maui case. Uh, but in any event, um, you're right that uh, each of the counties passed an, an ordinance addressing uh, genetically engineered crops in different ways, and the Kauai ordinance also addressed pesticide use uh, in that county. And the lower court, federal court in Hawaii, uh, found that all three of those ordinances uh, were uh, preempted by state and, and federal law, and therefore unenforceable. And all of those cases have, were appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit was in town about six weeks ago, and uh, I and, and other attorneys argued our appeals to try and persuade the court that those ordinances should not have been uh, found to be unlawful. So we're and waiting to hear from them. I see. So you've had the trial, you presented your case, and now you're, you're waiting the judgment, is that correct? Or is there more to... No, that we're, we're just waiting right now. It could take... Uh, a few months. It could take more than a few months. It's hard to say. Sometimes the Court of Appeals uh, rules quickly. Sometimes it takes takes longer. So there's nothing to do but wait. Okay. But the process is done except for waiting for the judgment. That's there's right. No more trial to do. What can you tell us about how did that go? Um, I mean, I'm particularly interested in the Hawaii County one, but I'm interested in the whole statewide situation. How did it go to your eyes? Well, I have always felt that the counties have strong arguments. And I obviously, uh, Judge Curran in the case of, of the Big Island and Kauai ordinances, uh, and Judge Mulway in the case of the Maui ordinance, disagreed. Uh, nevertheless, I continue to feel that the counties do have the authority to uh, regulate genetically engineered crops. The, the state of Hawaii has no laws whatsoever regulating genetically engineered crops, none at all. And the court's decision saying that notwithstanding that fact, only the state can regulate genetically engineered crops, I believe is unprecedented and simply not supported by the law in Hawaii or anywhere else. We'll see what the Ninth Circuit has to say. Uh, they may disagree, obviously. Very interesting. By the way, thank you for, for uh, arguing on behalf of our counties. And this an important issue. Now, you mentioned pesticides. I know that the Kauai case was largely involved with pesticide regulation in buffer zones, right? That's right. Tell me, for those who might not know, why is pesticides part of the discussion when we talk about regulating genetically engineered crops? Well, conventional farmers as well as uh, growers of genetically engineered crops or genetically engineered seed crops as, as is common in, in Hawaii, um, 
they all use pesticides. Uh, organic farmers don't, or at least the, the ones that they use are quite different from the pesticides that conventional farmers use. Uh, but the, the growing of experimental genetically engineered uh, crops is, is a very pe pesticide intensive operation. And if you go over, for example, uh, on, on Kauai, you go to the west side, you drive mile after mile of fields of uh, either experimental crops or commercialized seed producing operations. And they use many, many different pesticides and some of these are quite toxic. Uh, and uh, you know the reason it's it's in the discussion is because, for example, those on the west side, you've got towns like Kakaha, Waimea, that uh, where people live in in close proximity to these fields, and these pesticides do drift out of the fields, and people are exposed to them. They go into uh, the the surface water and go into the ocean, they go into, for example, uh, there's 40 miles of drainage ditches out on the west side of Kauai that go through the agricultural fields and drain into the ocean right there. Pesticides go into that water along with a lot of other pollutants. It's not treated at all. People go into those canals, people swim in the water right off the beach, and it's, it's at this point simply not even regulated for what's in that in that water. Uh, so, you know, if, if pesticides stayed exactly where they were sprayed, then the only issue would be the impact on the field workers, which can be very mm -hmm. significant, and the impact on people who eat the food. But it doesn't just stay where they put it. So you also have other people who are affected. It goes into the environment, and it into does. our oceans and your shore. Okay. Um, so a few years back, a couple of the counties uh, banned genetic modification of taro and coffee. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Uh, at, at, at this moment, uh, there is on the books, there has been for eight or nine years, an ordinance in Hawaii County that uh, bans genetically engineered coffee and kalo. And on Maui, they also have an ordinance that I think was passed the following year, if I'm not mistaken, that bans genetically engineered kalo. Um, nobody challenged those, even though the state was well aware of it at the time. Uh, the legislature never had anything to say about it. Industry never had anything to say about it. Nobody said, oh, you know, that the counties don't have that authority. Only the state can regulate genetically engineered crops. Nobody said a word about it because, in my view, nobody in the state actually believed that the counties did not have that authority mm. until the chemical companies came along and challenged in the uh, in the first case uh, the Kauai ordinance and the their attorneys made some creative arguments about the counties not having that authority and uh, Judge Curran was persuaded by those arguments but if if the Ninth Circuit upholds Judge Curran on that then um, it stands to reason that the Kahlo and the, the coffee ordinances will go down as well. It says, were county ordinances affecting GM, regulating GMO crops and they have never been challenged? That's right. So, I mean, for a simpleton like myself, it seems like, therefore, the counties have the right to regulate GMOs, but that's what is being decided by, by <laughs> greater minds than myself right now. Okay, good. Um, Recently, there was the Kauai Joint Fact-Finding Study, if I'm getting the name right. Right. It's supposed to be a, around, you know, a, a, a wide range of input. And tell me what you read. They came out with their final uh, report. What did you see in that report? What did you learn from it? What does it say? I've heard, I've heard people on both sides claiming that it vindicates one side completely and the other side says the exact same thing. What do you read in that report? What is it telling us? What I read in that report is that uh, the, there are pesticides, some of which are quite toxic, depending on who's exposed and to what extent, um, 
that are being found where legally they are not supposed to be and uh, where they would not be if they had been applied according to the label, which is the law. Mm. Uh, although, unfortunately, the labels are not as protective as they should be, because even if you follow the label, they can get into the environment. But ne nevertheless, they are found where they shouldn't be. Um, and, and I think a lot of the argument has been, well, is that harmful? And what I get from the report is that because the state has not done very much in the way of monitoring or sampling of air, of water, of soil for these chemicals, it's very difficult to answer that question definitively to say that it, no, it's absolutely harmless or it's very harmful. Uh, if you don't have data, it's hard to make scientific determinations. You Instead, you end up with fears, you have rhetoric, you have so forth. Um, and so I think the report was quite straightforward in saying that if we want to have science-based uh, determinations about what's going on, the state needs to do a much better job in actually taking samples and analyzing them uh, and not sitting on the sidelines. And, uh, and unless and until the state does that, I don't think either side can say that they are vindicated. Uh, I have heard the Department of Agriculture's perspective being, well, this, there, there's no proof here that it's hurting people. To me, that is, is a very irresponsible thing for a state agency to be saying, an agency that is responsible for regulating pesticide use uh, on behalf of the state, which is responsible for protecting public health and not just protecting the profits of uh, big ag, to be jumping on this report as if it demonstrates that pesticides in the envir environment are harmless. The report doesn't say anything like that. And suggesting that it, it does, I think, is just wrong and, and very disappointing. Um, so, so let me clarify. So the report states that there's no clear evidence of harm from pesticides, but it also states that the data that we would need to, to really come to that conclusion is absent. That's is that exactly correct? right. Okay. So whose job would it be to go out and begin to collect the data? Would that be the Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, EPA? I, I think that, the, that it's primarily on the Department of Health. Okay. And, and I think that uh, they have not been doing as good a job as they should be. Uh, I think that there is a lack of resources being put towards uh, addressing the issue of pesticides in Hawaii, whether on behalf of the Department of Health or the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is responsible for enforcing our pesticide laws, and I think it's doing uh, quite a poor job of that because it simply doesn't uh, devote the resources to it. And whether it's because they don't have the budget or because the legislature has not seen fit to give them the budget or their priorities within the budget they have, the bottom line is they're not doing the job that they are supposed to be doing. Uh, Paul, let me interrupt yeah. you there. We'll come back. We'll come back in just a minute. Sure. And thank you very much. We're here with Paul Achitoff, uh, managing attorney for Earth Justice in Hawaii. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman with the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining us. Aloha, this is Reg Baker with Business in Hawaii. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday at two o'clock. We would love to hear from you and you can reach us in several different ways. We have a hotline that you can call in at 415-871-2474 or you can email us at thinktechhawaii.com or you can tweet us at thinktechhi. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on our next show. Aloha. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We are uh, here live on Mondays at 3 p.m. and we bring guests like our best health coach, Elena Maganto. Uh, eat well and follow her tips. Viva la comida saludable. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science.
Welcome back. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I'm here at the Ruderman Roundtable with Paul Achitoff, Managing Attorney for the Hawaii Office of Earth Justice. Paul, we were talking about pesticides and regulations and the, uh, the, the fact that perhaps they're not being uh, regulated sufficiently here in Hawaii. Uh, is, is the state able to, from a financial point of view, if they wanted to, more properly regulate and monitor for pesticides, could they do it, or would they need more resources to do so? Well, the Department of Agriculture, which has currently uh, the primary authority to enforce pesticide laws in the state, uh, I believe they're understaffed. I don't think there's any question that they're understaffed. Uh, the, I believe the department knows it, the EPA certainly knows it. Uh, now, what their budget is and how they're allocating that budget, uh, I don't really think that that is the real question. The question is, how much do they need to do the job? And is the legislature giving them that amount of money? And if they are, why aren't they using it in that, in that way? And if they are not, why don't they? Uh, because there is a certain minimum amount of money that's needed. Uh, Hawaii is one of uh, 49 states that has been given by the EPA primary authority to enforce federal pesticide laws within their state. And EPA has been quite critical of our Department of Agriculture in its failure over the past several years to adequately enforce and investigate pesticide problems in the state. There is a big stack of, of uh, files sitting on the Department of Agriculture's desk that of pesticide uh, issues that have simply not been addressed. And some of these are so old, dating back uh, for almost a decade, that the statute of limitations has run out on some of these so that they couldn't be prosecuted even if there were, it was shown to be something that should be prosecuted. And the department knows this. EPA has made this very clear. Uh, and as a result, uh, I believe that EPA should revoke from the Department of Agriculture this authority and that EPA should take over this enforcement because I don't believe that the state is taking it seriously enough. They're simply not funding it adequately, or the department's not using the funds it has. I don't know which it is. But you know, I've been, do, I've been litigating environmental uh, violations for a long time, and it's quite common to hear agencies complain that they don't have the money, they don't have the money. We hear this all the time. What, what it, that usually means is there's a lack of political will. And sometimes you have to uh, go to court and say, look, you're breaking the law. You're pe putting people's health at risk because you are spending taxpayers' money in this way rather than in that way. So you need to make a decision. And you know, I, I believe in this case, if the state is not willing to put the kind of money towards enforcing pesticide laws that are, are necessary, then they shouldn't be entrusted with that authority and the EPA should take over. Has the EPA done that with any states? Do if it know? has, I'm not aware okay. of it. So the fact that the fact that we're even they're even looking at this Hawaii perhaps suggests that Hawaii's done a particularly bad job of regulating this. I think I think that's okay. true. I think I think that's true. Now, is it also true that we have a somewhat unique pesticide um, situation with all these experimental crops and the seed crops? Do we have a different type of pesticide you know, use environment than, than what's typical around the country? I think what's different and, and unique about our situation are two things. Number one, uh, Hawaii is uh, a place uh, that it has more experimental field trials for genetically engineered crops than anywhere else in the country. Um, that's number one. So you, and, and as I said, that's a very pesticide intensive industry. The other aspect of it is we're very small and we are uh, also very uh, densely populated in the sense that 
these fields are near population centers. Mm -hmm. If we were talking about some place in the Midwest where you have million, literally millions of acres uh, and the nearest town might be you know, 100 miles away, that's a little different mm -hmm. from where you have places like on Molokai or on Kauai uh, and even on Oahu where you have uh, towns that are literally down the street right. from heavy pesticide use. And then we have what we think of as pure, pristine coastal waterways right downstream from them, too. That in the Midwest, we might not have that problem as well in terms of... Well, the Midwest, the has, Midwest has a big problem, frankly, with pesticides in their surface waters. Uh -huh. uh, atrazine, for example, which is uh, a, a Syngenta product and is used uh, in Hawaii uh, quite a bit, um, has been found in practically all of the surface waters throughout the Midwest. If you look at a map uh, around the Mississippi Valley, everywhere where the big commodity crops, or where corn is grown, you will see that atrazine pollution is very widespread. And, and as a result, the, a lot of the, the uh, water boards of those counties have had to sue Syngenta for money to get that out of the water supply. And in fact, even Kauai County got some money from the settlement a few years ago uh, with, from a class action against Syngenta because of atrazine in the water supply. So uh, speaking of untreated runoff, uh, uh, um, pesticides flowing into the waterways and into the oceans, we were talking earlier uh, um, that you're involved in an action regarding ADC and untreated runoff. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, that's the Agribusiness Development Corporation, which is... And by the a, way, what do they do? I'm sorry. What they do uh, is that they are tasked with promoting agriculture in, in the state, and they are associated with the Department of Agriculture. And one of the things they do is they lease lands. For example, they lease a lot of the lands uh, over on Kauai on the west side that are currently being used by uh, the biotech companies but they lease land that were all over the state. Mm -hmm. uh, we filed a lawsuit a couple of weeks ago against ADC uh, for violations of the Clean Water Act. Over uh, near Kikaha and Waimea on, on Kauai, uh, there is a canal system, a drainage system, that is about 40 miles of canals that weave all through the fields and through the towns and drain directly into the ocean. The water's not treated, and it contains a variety of pollutants, including pesticides that come from these agricultural fields. And for many years, ADC had a permit under the Clean Water Act that restricted what could go in the water and required them to sample regularly and to report the results of their sampling uh, publicly on a regular basis. Last year, ADC decided that uh, it couldn't be bothered with this uh, permit compliance any longer and went to the Department of Health who said, okay, uh, you don't need a permit anymore. So we believe that that's legally wrong. We believe they're violating the Clean Water Act. We believe that uh, the public has a right to not only to know what's going into the ocean where they swim and fish and play, uh, but they, uh, they have a right to have limits on what can be put in that water. So we've sued them, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's brand new. That's a new That's a brand new lawsuit. Just starting yep. The Clean Water Act, now that's a federal act, and, but yes. they had a the permit from the State Department of Health, or it was a federal uh, the state de it's 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 a federal permit that is, uh, or a permit that is issued under federal law, the Clean Water Act is a federal law, but the State Department of Health has been delegated the authority to administer the Clean Water Act in certain respects in the state, just as the Department of Agriculture has been delegated authority to enforce federal pesticide laws in the state. Uh, if if a state agency demonstrates that it has the resources to do the job, 
then it can get this authority. If it doesn't have the resources, then the federal agencies can take this authority back. Now, the ADC, is it a, is it a, a part of the Department of Agriculture, or is it a separate or semi-autonomous agency? It, it's, it's a, I'm not aware of, of another agency. There may be others within the state that are similarly set up. I don't know of any others, but it is a separate affiliated in certain ways with the Department of Agriculture, the Board of Directors. There's, there are you know, people sitting on the Board of ADC that come from the Department of Agriculture as well as other agencies. So there is a relationship there, uh, the funding relationships and so forth, but it is a separate corporation with, with defined tasks. Now, does the ADC, when they lease land, do they make any value a judgment of you're going to grow seed crop, you're going to grow flowers, you're going to grow food to be consumed in the state? Do they make do they do they have any kind of mandate to try to help food production in the state, or is it simply a matter of leasing agricultural land to whoever wants to? Well, I think that's a question of how they interpret their mandate. Mm -hmm. You know, they may interpret their mandate as simply. Uh, leasing it to anyone who grows anything. Um, you know, I think whether that's what the legislature intended, whether that's what's in the public interest, those are different questions. Let me stop you right there, Paul. We're almost out of time. Um, tell me, Earth Justice, uh, how would someone contact you if they want to learn more about you? How can they get involved and, and support what you do at Earth Justice? Well, Earth Justice, uh, has a very uh, extensive website, Earth Justice. Uh, just Google Earth Justice and it'll be right there. And it will show what work we're doing in all of our offices around the country. Uh, every case that we file gets represented there on some level. Press releases are, are put up there for people to read. Where There are blogs in which we discuss the cases that we're working on. Uh, if people want to donate money, which we always appreciate, there's an opportunity to do that on the website. So I encourage people to check it out and see what we're doing. Well, thank you. As a layperson who cares very much about the environment, I take great comfort in knowing that an organization like Earth Justice exists and that you're as powerful and successful in advocating for the environment as you have been. Thank you very much for joining me today, Paul. Thank you very much, Russell. This is State Senator Russell Ruderman at the Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. You, uh, you can follow us at Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you in two weeks. Mahalo.